Uh, I think we're going to get started. Yeah? OK. Great. Um, so my name is Emily Aros. I'm with the Red Cross. We also have Seth from Stamen um, and Nick, who is the lead developer for Open Map Kit. Um, and we're going to be talking about Possum. Um, Possum is basically a bunch of tools kind of strung together with bailing wire in a way that actually really works well. And so in keeping with that, our talk is going to be three people from different organizations who just met yesterday um, stringing together a talk that hopefully works well and makes sense. Um, so I'll talk about the context for the problems we were trying to solve and why we actually had this developed. Um, I'll pass it over to Seth, who'll go through Possum itself and the tech component. Um, and then Nick is going to do kind of an interactive demo with you guys. Um, so sit tight. Um, so a lot of you are probably familiar with the Missing Maps project that the Red Cross has been a part of for the last couple of years. And through that, we do a lot of remote tracing with people all around the world. We do a lot of community mapping with different Red Crosses in various countries. And then we work with people to try to make the data actually useful in practice. And so um, last year, we just developed Open Map Kit. We were piling in different projects in Rwanda and Bangladesh and things like that. This year, we scaled up in a very big way for community mapping. Um, we are just finishing mapping um, between five and 7,000 communities, everything within 15 kilometers of the border between Guinea, Liberia, and Sierra Leone. Um, the reason we've done this is because uh, this was an area that is extremely vulnerable uh, for Ebola, for other things like that. And there was a lot of fantastic tracing done as part of the hot activation for Ebola. But we're two years later. We need to be updating this. And also, these are very difficult to map remotely in the first place. So we're sending people in on motorbikes to all these communities. Um, it works out to be an area roughly the size of Switzerland for perspective. Um, and so we're sending them in there to do, they are physically visiting each and every one of these villages. They're doing some surveying. And then other communities, I think 100 of these, we are mapping every single building, water point, school, et cetera. Um, so this was a huge project for us. This was a, a, fin a huge scaling up of what we were doing. Uh, we had four months to do this. Um, and so we had to kind of step back and think about, OK, what's our tool set? What's going to work here? And what do we need to innovate very, very quickly to get this done? Um, so in the past, we, work, we do a lot of work with field papers and with open map kit. So we have a paper-based solution, and we have kind of mobile phone-based. And that's been great. Um, it works really well. Um, but there are some limitations that we faced. Um, for West Africa, we're working um, kind of from the moment we set foot in this area, we realized that this was going to be a very remote place to work and a very challenging place to work. Um, Connectivity is a huge problem. Um, many of the roads are impassable to cars point blank. Other ones are only passable during the dry season, which is about four or five months. Um, this is kind of standard practice for our volunteers. This is what they're having to traverse. Um, we, our volunteers will go for up to a week at a time without having any sort of cell data or internet connection. Um, and so if they're in the field using, using mobile phones and things like that, we don't know if something has gone wrong. We don't know if our surveys are working. We can't do any sort of troubleshooting often for a long time. Um, in the past, I mentioned that you know, mobile data solutions are fantastic when they work. Um, but when they don't, uh, we have some problems. So last year in Rwanda, we wanted to be using Open Map Kit to do some field work in a rural area. Um, we had some problems with MB tiles at the last minute. Um, and then we had some problems because uh, I think it was the week after the Nepal earthquake. And so OSM was a little overloaded. Um, and basically, like our troubleshooting was that we had to stay up all night with headlamps, because we also didn't have electricity, um, taping field papers together and just kind of hoping for the best. Um, and it was great. I mean, we got it done. But I also, uh, Dale, my boss, can tell you that I also drafted a resignation letter during this trip. Um, <laughs> So um, humanitarians are increasingly using cloud-based technology and mobile phones and things like that. But we're also working in more and more remote places. And so we need something that works as a bridge so that, um, yes, you can use these things offline and collect data. But you also need to be able to actually push that somewhere. Or if you need to modify a survey on the fly because there's a problem or the translation doesn't make sense, you need something that's actually a solution you can use in the field. Um, so we worked on Possum. Portable OpenStreetMap. And looks like this. This is a $300 piece of hardware um, with some very fancy software that basically runs our full suite of tools. We can run a mapathon, um, depending on the Wi Fi card in there. We can support a mapathon with, I don't know, up to 100 people um, editing OpenStreetMap. We can um, cut field papers. We can, um, 
we can develop ODK and open map kit surveys. Uh, we can pull data off and check where that is. Uh, we know all kinds of things. We're actually kind of just scratching the surface. We can also transfer Game of Thrones episodes to each other while we're in the field or on a plane. Um, so we're still learning other things that we've got as bonus features. Uh, but it's been a real game changer for us. Uh, it means that you know, in Liberia, we can drive around, power this thing off of our car, um, and we can pull data off of our volunteers. We can check it in real time and see, are they doing the surveys properly? Are they doing the mapping properly? Are they having any problems? If so, what are they? And we can basically go through it again with them in the field, make any changes that are necessary. Um, the Land Cruiser, Cruiser becomes our mobile office. Um, it's also fantastic because it means that there is no change in our technical tool set that we use between if we were mapping here in the States versus in the middle of nowhere. Um, as part of this project, we also developed a mapping hub um, in Gekadu, Guinea, uh, which was, I think, the epicenter of the Ebola outbreak. And this is a physical building that's equipped with four staff, a bunch of computers, training rooms, and things like that. And it's kind of both our base of operations and also a way that we're trying to build a sustainable community of mappers in the local area. Um, and the center doesn't actually have internet because when we finally got a quote, I think it was $30,000 for three months of internet. Um, so we said, no, thank you, and we're tethering off of phones, but basically for day to day, we run everything off of Possum. Um, so we can literally be disconnected for months at a time. So we basically um, plug it in, get it ready, go to the field, and then plug it back in at the end. Um, so this is fantastic. We are so excited that these guys were able to develop this in time for us to use. Um, works great, and I will pass the mic over and let them tell you more about it. Thanks. So the, as, as she said, the, we call this portable OpenStreetMap, and it's really intended to be all of the different components from OpenStreetMap um, portable. Um, so what it actually says on the tin. Um, get into that a little bit more in a second when I talk about the, the tools that, that make it up. But first, a brief shout out to our sponsors and employers, Spatial Dev, who did the, the initial work on Open Map Kit and also worked with, on, with Stamen on Possum, and then the Red Cross for funding us all in the first place. But really, most importantly for all of you, because you guys are the ones that are creating all the data, and you guys are creating all of the tools that make this stuff possible. Um, we didn't write a whole lot of custom software for this at all. It's all glue. So. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. So stepping back, when we originally approached this project, we wanted to be able to combine Open Map Kit, which allows individuals to do the surveys out in the field, with field papers that also allows individuals to work out in the field, and to combine the two so that when you create a field paper, there's a corresponding Open Map Kit survey. And then there's also a way to collaborate and coordinate while you're in the field so that the field papers that you use on day two can incorporate the, the survey responses from day one without actually having to be connected to the internet. So I think of this as technology for uncertain environments, and I think West Africa falls into that category. I think that um, hotel Wi-Fi often falls into that category. <laughs> because you, you never know what you're going to get, and it's, there's just a huge amount of uncertainty around it. And you can't rely on utilities. So we, we have power, we think of power as a utility. In the United States, we think of cell phones as a utility. We think of internet as a utility. But in large parts of the world, it's not a utility. Information goes back to being a logistics problem where you need to move data from one point to another. And the, there's, there's this notion of sneaker net that we've had in universities for years. I mean, how we share Game of Thrones with one another. And it turns out that it's also motorcycle net in West Africa where you've got somebody that's picking up some uh, open map kit surveys on something like this, which is, this is an Intel Edison, and you can run an entire Wi-Fi access point off of it and run open, data, open map kit server on it to collect data. And then you put it in the pouch of the motorcycle and then you drive to the mapping hub and then you're good. So um, Portable Open Street Map combines open map kit which is the survey tool built on top of Open Data Kit, and field papers, which I'm not going to get into a whole lot. Uh, Lindsay Jacks from Cadasta is going to be giving a talk on that, I think, tomorrow. That you guys should, hi, nice to meet you. Um, that you guys should all go to and, and find out more about, and also see how it's being used in other contexts like land rights. Uh, we're also going to hold a birds of a feather session at 5 p.m. in Pigot uh, 19, I think. 109. 109, okay, I missed the zero, there we go. 
Um, and we'll have uh, a couple of the Possum devices kicking around there, and you can talk to us about what's there. Uh, and I'm also going to be around on Monday during the code sprint, because maybe we want to add some additional functionality. I've been talking to Stephen Mather about combining it with Open Drone Map. You know, who knows? Um, oh, uh, Anna from Anna from Spatial Dev wanted some more cat pictures. Um, this is from our field testing trip to Ecuador. I thought it was pretty cute. So this is also from our field testing trip to uh, Ecuador. And this is people actually, this is the, the local volunteers working on it and figuring out the areas that they're gonna map in the first place. And this is the hardware, so approaching the hardware approach to it. So piles of phones all charged off of a USB hub. Uh, and then the $300 and under 12 watts or 10 watts or something like that. I've got a kilowatt, we can try that later. Uh, and find out how much it actually is. And it's pretty powerful, it's got eight gigs of RAM, I think it's a quad core, might be a dual core, I've got a couple of these kicking around. So it can run everything. And then it's its own Wi-Fi hotspot, those of you that have connected to the possum access point in the room, again, awesome possum is the password. Uh, it's, a, it's a local hotspot, and it's, it's, your inter, it's your internet, it's your intranet, and it's running actually a full copy of OpenStreetMap that contains the data intended for the area that you're editing, which means that you can create field papers, and you can edit data like you normally would in ID or JOSM. And you can enhance it with all sorts of other stuff. Um, this is a picture from the Red Cross headquarters in DC uh, prior to the West Africa trip heading out. And uh, over in the corner there, um, that's like 100 or 200 cell phones in a couple of Ziploc bags um, that, are, that are being sent out. So this is the kind of stuff that, that ends up augmenting it and makes it sensible for their environment. So the question is, is it, user, is it user friendly? And I would say no, it's really not user friendly. Um, but I talked to these guys and apparently it is. So um, we've got a really long way to go, partially because it's in many ways a proof of concept, but it's actually being used in the field fairly effectively. And it can be applied to other scenarios using other software and other data. There's no reason that it has to be OpenStreetMap. There's no reason that it has to be Geo. It can be moving cloud services offline to be used at track meets. Talk to Jacob Lesser about that. Um, he bought some of this hardware and is playing around with doing timing and registration and stuff like that at the track meets. Um, it's disposable OSM for workshops. So if you're doing education, you can bring one of these along, people can deface it, and it's never gonna modify OpenStreetMap. And if your Wi-Fi sucks, fine, not a big deal. Um, you can install Etherpad on it, you can do all sorts of things. You could mail Wikipedia updates by mail. Um, and have a, a portable server in a village that allows them to look at, look at Wikipedia in, in isolated places. Um, so Nick's gonna talk a little bit about the open map kit end of things and what types of possibilities uh, the whole platform opens up. Hi, yes we promised a demo, but we need a HDMI gender switcher adapter to get a Chromecast connected to that. So. We'll just have to show you at a birds of feather later. Anyway, um, instead I want to talk about um, what can Possum be used with applications outside of what the Red Cross is doing. Um, it was built for the needs of the Red Cross and they were very much what we had in mind while building this entire thing. But there's a lot more that you can do because this is OpenStreetMap, the software running somewhere else. It's not running on OpenStreetMap.org. What's really special about that is you can put any data in there that you want and you can have that data be under any license that you want. So for example, if you were a county service, maybe King County, and you had um, sewer data or you had very um, intricate GIS data of the curbs of every street in Seattle, you might not want to put that in OpenStreetMap. It just doesn't really make sense. However, OpenStreetMap, the software, really does make sense for these strange use cases. And what's really special about it is that there are businesses out there that do a really, really good job at cartography, delivering maps, and providing OpenStreetMap-related web services. So what's really special is if you are generating data in the same schema as OpenStreetMap with OpenStreetMap tags, you can easily deploy that. You can easily have web maps. You can easily have mobile applications that use that data without extra work. 
that extra work that you would have to do if you were using proprietary GIS to create a map. Um, some other applications that I think could be really useful are um, is data that needs to not be public. Data that contains trade secrets for companies, um, like a distribution network for a transportation company, um, gold prospects, things like that. Um, <laughs> thinking about Seattle and the Pacific Northwest, think about Warehouser and all the data that they have. They have GIS data that really doesn't make sense to be an open street map because it's has information like where, how old are the trees in a stand? Um, what is the boundary of a riparian area? Things like that. And that's like what I envision Possum in addition to the humanitarian world where it can live and the potential that can come from that. Um, so like I said, there's an ecosystem of creating open street, map, open street maps. And there's a lot of companies that support open street maps but there isn't much going on for running your own OpenStreetMap server. Questions? Questions? <laughs> what kind of adapter do you need? Um, so I have a Chromecast, and you can use, like, the cool thing about Chromecast is you can screen share your Android device, and it's a male HDMI connection. And the dongle we have here is also male, so we would need a female to female. Cool. Should have just asked that at the beginning of the talk. <laughs> Any other questions? Um, so the possum itself, the hardware costs three hundred dollars, but in reality, it's more like three hundred fifty. But still. I mean, if you could afford to get to this conference, you probably could afford the hardware for a possum. And the software is free completely. And on GitHub right now. Um, it's all under the BSD license, so you can extend it. You can use it in your own products, et cetera. Um, then, of course, you need an Android phone. The reason why we use OpenMapKit on Android phones is that you can buy one for $50. So when the Red Cross, for example, is going to Liberia, they will have hundreds of phones. Um, similarly, uh, outside of the United States, outside of Europe, everybody has an Android phone. Nobody has iPhones. So that's why that was our, our main goal of doing Android first. What operating system? Um, so the Possum itself is running Ubuntu 14.04, um, and if you're curious about how that integrates and deploys, um, one of our repos is called Possum Build, and it's a suite of shell scripts that installs all of our software on that specific setup. Uh, yes, so um, that's a good question about Raspberry Pi and other hardware profiles. Um, we have used it on a lot of different devices. We've used, used Raspberry Pis, uh, we've used Intel Nux, we've used BeagleBones, etc. The thing is, the actual OpenStreetMap stack has a pretty heavy requirement for rendering the tiles themselves, but you can use things like a Raspberry Pi for the rest of it. So if you are doing the Open Data Kit workflow and you're collecting the data, but you're not so much um, rendering the maps, you can install less on things like a Raspberry Pi. Uh, Raspberry Pis work really well. Um, and actually, our beginning premise was to get it to run on an Intel Edison. So the Open Map Kit server part, where you collect the survey data, um, and runs on this. This is like, um, was it 0.6 volts? I mean, you can basically keep this thing powered for weeks, and it's tiny. Um, this one is about uh, 60 bucks, yeah, something like that. Um, those are really fun to, to use. Um, basically, anything that runs Ubuntu will work.
and then you'd go out in the field and you'd update it, and then when you got back to civilization, you re-upload it. Uh, yeah, it's not an image, it's the actual data itself. So we get extracts of OpenStreetMap data for the region, the area of interest we call it. And you basically can update that data in your surveys on the Possum as well as through OpenMapKit surveys. And then we sync it up to the main OpenStreetMap when everything's done and validated and corrected in the field. Yes. So the question was, we to use the possum, do we construct the boxes themselves with the instruction on, on GitHub? And yes, you don't have to physically construct the box. You can buy um, an Intel NUC in casing already, or you can get your own casing and buy it without it. It's up to you. Um, and then you basically uh, can follow the instructions and get an image of Ubuntu on and bootstrap the software. Or if you send me brownies and the cost of the equipment, I'll do it for you. <laughs> That's, good. That's a good option too. Yeah. Yes, uh, Seth should. That's really complicated, but yes. Um, and that's actually one of the really big success stories about this. Uh, we've got a rather convoluted process that I've been sharing with some people and going to write it up. It's, well, it's written up. I'm going to share it out more generally soon, uh, where it actually uses Git to uh, handle all the conflict resolution by taking a current copy and then comparing it to whatever the stale copy is and then uh, reducing all of the merge conflicts as much as possible so that it can be done in hopefully like 15 minutes by somebody who's familiar with the editing. And then it pushes each of the change sets that are made available offline back up. So if you look at it, um, there's a de Kuntz, um Ecuador. Hmm? Yeah, uh, it's, it's an import account that has probably 360 change sets or so in it uh, that represents all of the changes that occurred while we were in Ecuador. Uh, definitely, yeah. Um, the yeah. So the question was, can you lock or can you basically lock an entire region? It, it would depend on the size of the region, but if it's an area that doesn't receive that many edits, there aren't going to be that many conflicts. If it is an area that receives a lot of edits, you're just going to need to do more conflict detection. But that stuff can all happen at once when you're doing the the reimport. No, I was just going to say, yeah. The practicalities of this region is that. The Red Cross is, we're really the only ones doing editing uh, in the border areas. I think we kept an eye on it for a few months before we actually got to the field when we were planning and there was no one else working in this area. Um, there's really bad cloud cover on the satellite imagery and then just, there's not a lot of local editors in the border areas. So. One nice thing I'd like to mention is that um, we, we want to have more organizations involved and part of what's special about this is we want to have more of a data exchange. OpenStreetMap is a spatial data exchange, it's, but it's a lot easier to use than a geo portal. And so what's really special is if you, if the Red Cross does a bunch of work in um, Liberia, for example, and then another organization wants to share similar work, by uploading it to stream, uh, OpenStreetMap, you have that similarity. When you do surveys in OpenMapKit, one thing unique about it is there is a link back to the Open Data Kit survey in the chain set. So you can be surveying data that is not map related, that isn't tagged in OpenStreetMap, but you can still find that link back to um, the survey data itself in OpenStreetMap. I think so. Um, I had a really awesome experience a little while ago where um, the the possum in the other in the other building didn't have all of the pieces required to serve map tiles, and it also wasn't connected to the internet. So um, I borrowed Beth's Android phone, 
uh, plugged it into a USB port on the device and turned USB tethering on and then it had internet access. Which uh, it's th really, yeah, yes. <laughs> Just I don't know what specific hardware. Did we have time for one more or was that the last one? one more. Okay, one more. Uh, are there privacy or security settings for mapping really sensitive data? Uh, not yet, except for the fact that it's physically isolated from your network. I mean, that, so uh, it's got an error gap around it. Um, we're, this is one of the things that uh, I think Brooke mentioned before, um, or no, you're Brooke, yeah, anyway. Um, we need to put an HTTPS, we need to put an SSL certificate on it, and we've also looked into doing encryption of some of the data. It's on the, it's on the eventual roadmap, but it's not currently supported. Cool. Thank you guys for everything. Um, birds of Feather at five if you want to know more or if you're around for the code sprint, come find me and we'll um, try and make it do new things because that would be fun. <laughs>